All right, Psalm 10 is a very, very specific psalm. It's just dealing with, essentially, it's just dealing with one topic here, and it's dealing with the subject. Of course, many of the psalms are, are, are dealing with very similar things. These songs are songs, you know, crying out to God for help because of wicked people and because of being in times of trouble and being persecuted and things like this. But we see a lot of attributes of, of a very, very wicked person or very wicked people laid out in this psalm. And we're going to get into that quite a bit. But that first verse is very interesting. And this is something that I think we all feel from time to time, especially when you go through the really difficult parts of your life. Look it down in there. Verse number one in Psalm 10, the Bible says, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself? in times of trouble. And this is what it feels like from the human perspective, from our perspective here on earth. Sometimes when we're going through difficult times, when we're being tried, when there's a lot of stress, when there's a lot of pressure, when everything seems to be going in a, in a precarious situation or where you seem to be getting a lot of uh, persecution or affliction, times of trouble, hardships, you know, maybe you're going through problems with your health, going through problems financially, going through problems with relationships, with your marriage, with your children, with your spouse. Many times you might feel like, well, where is God in all of this? Where are you, God? Why are you hiding yourself when everything seems to be going bad for me? Everything's falling apart around me. Why, why can't I find you anywhere? Now, do you think God is really hiding? Because I don't. This is, this is just our perception. These are things that we perceive as, as you know, human beings stuck in our, in our time-space continuum, whereas we're going forward through time and something bad happens. See, you, you don't, oftentimes people aren't even thinking about, well, where is God when everything's going okay? But if you were to just be like, oh man, where's God hiding now? It would be, it would be the same, you know, you probably feel the same way, but it, you, don't, you don't notice it when things are going well. We sometimes feel like God is hiding when we go through the pressure, we go through the stress, and there's a lot of problems being put on us. But oftentimes, there's a reason why God doesn't just step in immediately and just fix every single problem that you have every time. And the reason why is because it's actually beneficial for us to go through hard times and to experience problems, to experience hunger, to experience pain, to experience sorrow. These are all things that in the end will bring forth uh, uh, good qualities and good characteristics in ourselves and will help us to deal with more things and to go through harder times. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter number 4. I had a conversation. I can't remember if I brought this up in a sermon or not. Not very long ago, I had a conversation with somebody out soul winning. It's about a month ago. And we were talking about God, you know, why doesn't God step in and, do, and, and, and help out and just stop all the evil and wickedness from happening, you know, every time it's going to happen? Well, if you think about living in a world where you don't experience hunger, you don't experience pain, you don't experience some of the things that we consider to be like negative things, well then you won't have as much appreciation for when things are going well, when you are fed, when you are taken care of. And these are things that um, I think are essential for us to have to go through to help us to be better people, not to be spoiled brats. You notice that the children that grow up maybe in an affluent house where they're not taught things, where they're not taught their own personal responsibility, but everything is given to them, everything is handed to them on a platter. Regardless of what they do, they get everything they want. They don't have to work for anything. They don't have to earn anything. They just grow up with this expectation of everything being given to them those children grow up to be terrible people. They grow up to be very needy. They grow up thinking that the world owes them something. They grow up thinking that, that other people ought to just give them whatever they want. Why? Because they've never had to go through a hard time themselves. It's important. And, and one of the things that's important as a, as a parent, you know, because you love your children, you want to be able to 
help them through things, and you should help them through things. You want what's best for them. But sometimes what's best for a child isn't just giving them everything that they want. And we need to remember this. That's why, you know, even in the form of discipline, when it comes to spanking, you know, yeah, it causes your child to cry and be sad and upset. And, you know, as a parent, you don't always like your children, seeing your children upset. You like seeing them happy. You want them to be full of joy. But it's necessary for them to go through those difficult times where they have to endure a punishment. But not just punishment. I mean, that's, that's actually pretty easy. What gets harder, I think, is especially as your kids start to get a little older, and even when they're young, it's good to teach us from a young age that the children are not going to get everything that they want. They're not going to be able to play. They're not going to be able to do just anything that they want unless they do some work first, unless they're able to get through, you know, roll up their sleeves, do some house chores, do some things that, that is going to be something they don't want to do in order to be able to do what they do want to do and learn an ethic, learn a work ethic that, that's going to tell them, I need to work, I need to get things done in order to do other things because I need to learn how to be a hard worker. And we see, you know, God ends up putting us through some hard times, which will help us to be better people. To not be focused on everyone else owing us something, but us rather being focused on everybody else. And when you go through a hard time, and I've heard this multiple times, even recently within the past year in this church, where people have been going through some severe, severe hardships, especially with their health and being laid up in a hospital and having no one to come visit them and, and you know, all this other stuff. I've heard people say, you know, when I get out of here, I'm going to start visiting people more. I'm going to stay in better contact with people. Why? Because when you go through something, you see what it's like on the other end. You know what it's like personally, intimately, what it's like to not have people there for you. Therefore, when you go through those things, if you go through them at least with a righteous attitude, you have a tendency to say, well, since I know what it's like to go through this, I want to help other people that might be in the same situation that I was in so that they don't have to go through such a hard time and I can do more good to help other people instead of always being focused on myself. 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to see um, what the Bible has to say about this. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. The Bible is saying, you know, believer, saint, Christian, don't think that it's weird or strange when hard times come. And it says a fiery trial. You know, a trial is one thing. A fiery trial is very serious. Don't think it's strange when you go through some extremely rough patches and very difficult times where it's a fiery trial. Don't think that it's weird as though some strange thing happened. Oh, how could this possibly happen to me? Because it ought to happen. It's going to happen. And, and the more godly and Christ-like that you live, you should expect it to happen. Look at the trials and the tribulations and the persecutions that you went through or that Jesus went through in his life here. It was not just a bed of roses. He did not just have everything handed to him. He did not just live in the lap of luxury and everybody just came and served him. On the contrary, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of effort. On the contrary, he suffered persecution. He had people out to kill him, and yet he still ministered unto others. So don't think it's strange. The more Christ-like that you try to live, don't think it's a strange thing when some fiery trial comes your way. But look what it says in verse 13, but rejoice. Be, rejoice. Be happy about it. When the trial comes, and as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, he's saying you're in good company. Think about everything that Christ went through. So when you go through the trials, hey, be happy about that. Think that you're accounted worthy to go through things, something maybe anywhere even remotely close to what Jesus went through. The harder, difficult, more difficult time that you have to go through, you think about, well, what Jesus went through. I'm getting closer to what he had to go through. So 
I'm going to rejoice for that. It says that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Verse number 14. Now, I'm turning here because I don't have the rest of this in my note, but it's, it's important to get this whole thing in context. Verse number 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So what this is saying is that the trial is good. You should be joyful and happy for the trials, for the hard times, when you're doing what's right, when you are living a godly life, when you are doing what's right, that is when it's a good to be happy about it. But it continues on here, verse number 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. So if you have this, you, what you think to be a fiery trial and, oh man, I'm going through really hard times, but it's as a result of your own sin, you just have to endure that and that's not the one that's going to make you real happy about. And that's not one that you need to be rejoicing over because you're not going to receive rewards for going through a difficult time when you brought everything on yourself. You ought to take that patiently. You ought to be able to say, well, I did wrong. I sinned, so I just have to take whatever is given to me and not get bitter about it and go through it. But that's not something that's going to be really joyful because you did that to yourself and it's the, the, you're reaping what you sow. And that's why he says in verse number 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer. I mean, hey, yeah, if you're suffering for the cause of Christ, be happy about that. Be joyful about that. You're in good company. God's going to reward you for that. But when you're suffering because it's your own fault, that's not something to be happy about. Verse number 16, yet if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. He's saying, but if, if you're not a murderer, if you're not a thief, if you're not just reaping what you're sown, but you get thrown in jail, don't be ashamed of that. There's no shame in saying, oh, I was persecuted, I was imprisoned, I was beaten because of the name of Christ. So don't be ashamed about that. It's a badge of honor because that puts you in good company. Be happy about that. Rejoice because you're racking up rewards for yourself in heaven. Amen and amen. So that's the, uh, the teaching here. Turn back, if you would, now to chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter in chapter number 1, look at verse number 6, the Bible says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That word heaviness, there's a weight bearing down on you. We, we typically use the word stress, right? You're stressed out. He says, if need be, right now you're in heaviness or you're stressed out through manifold temptations because you're going through a lot of trials because there's a lot of things going bad in your life. He says, for a season, you may be in heaviness. For a little while, for a period of time, you may be experience a lot of stress or a lot of pressure in your life because there's all these different trials happening, all these different manifold temptations. But look at verse number seven, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What's important when you go through the difficult times, the persecutions, the trials, the temptations, is that you maintain the faith. You maintain it inwardly and outwardly. You let people know, hey, I'm going through a, a difficult time. I know it. I get it. But I'm going to maintain my faith. I'm going to continue to do what's right. And I'm going to trust the Lord, whether I have a lot or a little, whether, I, whether I'm being blessed or whether I'm not, don't seemingly, where I'm not seemingly being blessed, at least on the outward. And that's why it says that the, the trial of our faith, what's on the inside, that faith that we possess is much more precious than of the gold that perishes. So maybe you're facing a lot of trials and temptations with gold being taken away, the physical gold, physical money, finances are going in the tank. And you're all stressed out about it. What are we going to do? 
We don't need to be that stressed out about it, especially if the cause is not from our own sin, not from our own faults, but rather, especially if it's from persecutions, from people who hate God, from people who are, are persecuting you based on your faith. Hey, that means your faith is being tried. Why? Why is it being tried? Because if someone's persecuting you because of your faith, well, the temptation is going to be, well, maybe I should just shut up. Maybe if I were just to not say anything, that's going to offend people. Maybe if I'd stop preaching against the homos. Maybe if I wouldn't be public about it. You know, I could put a bushel over my candlestick. And not let everyone know the truth of the word of God. Maybe if I could do all this stuff, then I could get more physical gold. That's the purpose of the trial, to see what are you going to do? Are you going to compromise God's word? Are you going to be silenced by the attacks of the devil? Are you going to be silenced by the people that hate God? Are you going to sell yourself out for money? Or are you going to sell yourself out for serving the Lord? And when you can maintain your faith, and you get through that trial, it's worth way more than the gold that perisheth. Why? Because God sees your faith and you'll be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ because that moment's going to matter way more than the moment that you're in right now. And we need to remember the day that Jesus Christ comes back because at the judgment seat of Christ when Jesus takes his kingdom there's going to be praise and honor and glory for those that maintain their faith even through the most difficult situations and praise God for that so we know go back to Psalm 10 we understand that we might feel sometimes like we don't know where God is, but that's just because our view is so narrow in the scope of time. It's because we can't see into the future. And that's where faith comes in, because faith is belief or trust in the unknown, in the future things. What's going to happen? Well, we know that God is here with us, when we're serving God, when we're doing everything right, even if we're being tried and we're going through a hard time, we don't have to physically see God. We don't have to have something good happen right now because we could just look at this and say, hey, I know I'm going through a trial. I know this is a temptation and I know what the Bible says about this and I know that I all I need to do at this moment in my life is just maintain my faith. Keep working forward. Keep pushing through. Don't compromise. Don't back down. Keep doing what's right. Because this will end. The trial will cease. And we need to make sure that we could come through like gold. Come through the fiery trial. Knowing that God was there the whole time. He's not forsaking you. He may just be trying you just to see where your heart is. Is your heart truly with serving the Lord? Are you really dedicated? Are you really sold out to serving God? Sometimes he wants to see that from us. It's really easy to say with your mouth, I'll do anything for God. I'll go anywhere for God. I'll serve him. I'll, I'll do whatever God wants me to do. People say that all the time. The children of Israel said that. No, the Lord is our God. When Joshua said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Oh, no, no, we're going to serve the Lord. It's easy to say that, but then every time something bad came up, they're running to Baal or they're, you know, they're, they're getting off into, into their idolatry and everything else. God brings trials and temptations and sometimes then they have to be there to bring people back to God and realize how foolish they were when they got lifted up with pride when things were going good and they turned their back on God. There's, there's all kinds of events that happen and many of them are trials and we need to, to make sure that we understand you know, God is not far off from us. God is not hiding himself. It may seem like that for a moment but he's there. 
Look at verse number two. And this is the, the rest of this chapter basically explains, you know, why the psalmist here feels like, hey, where is God? You know, this is a time of trouble. And he's going to go into describing the wicked. Look at verse number two of Psalm 10. Turn back, if you would, to Psalm 10, verse number two. The Bible reads, the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. Now you're going to see a lot of attributes about the wicked. I mentioned this already. But you also see, and you'll notice this, the contrast between the wicked and the poor and sometimes the rich and the poor. Now, a wicked person isn't always rich by any means. But there are many people who are rich that are wicked. Wicked people, rich, poor, they could be anything. And what you also see is the wicked person, whether they're rich or poor, will often persecute the poor. Even poor, wicked people persecute other poor people. Why? Because they're wicked. Why do the proud persecute the poor? Because here, it's the wicked in his pride. So the wicked, whether they're rich or poor, the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Well, if someone is proud, they're lifted up in themselves. They're full of themselves. They're haughty. They think more about themselves than anybody else. So they care about themselves. They're full of themselves. And the poor are viewed by the proud as unimportant. Or maybe even as, as you know, subhuman why? Because the proud looks at them as, as much, much, you know, more inferior. And especially the rich, wicked people that are proud. They get so full of themselves, thinking that everything that I got is all by the works of my hand. I earned everything that I have. And these people don't have anything. And they're just scum. And they're just low life. And I did this, and they didn't, so they are less of a person than I am. They are less important. This is the attitude or the mindset, and this is why the pride of the wicked persecutes the poor. Because in their mind, they could justify doing bad things, doing evil, and persecuting the poor because they don't view them as being on the same level as they are. They also, the poor also don't have the power that wealth brings, so they're more vulnerable. So you have wicked people out to harm others. It's a lot easier to go and do wrong and violate a poor person. Why? Because they can't afford the lawyers. They're not going to sue them and take them to court and try to get things uh, rectified legally. They can't do it. They're not in the position to do that. They don't have wealth. They don't have power. So oftentimes, they just get persecuted and they just have to take it and that's the way it is. And the wicked people know that. The wicked rich people especially know this and they become easy target, targets to enrich the greedy, proud, rich person who's just looking to get more money and doesn't care who he's stealing it from and actually steals it from those who are the easiest targets but have the least amount of money and makes their situation even worse because they're so wicked and they don't care. Verse number three, for the wicked boasteth. There we see pride again, boasting, bragging of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. So the wicked person He's boasting, he's bragging of all his heart's desire, of all his money and of all of his greed. And he blesses the covetous. He blesses those. He speaks well of those that are also covetous like him, that are also all about the money. He gives blessings to those people, to his fellow wolves. But the Bible says that's who the Lord hates. The wicked person blesses the people whom God hates. And yes, you're seeing that right. The Lord abhors the covetous. That's why co the covetous are, are mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 of people who, as a believer, 
are not to be fellowship. If someone that's called a brother is covetous, they are to be put away from the congregation and to be treated as a heathen man. You're not even supposed to go out and eat with that person. That's how serious covetousness is. God hates it. God hates the covetous, but the wicked blesses the covetous. Now, when you read the word of God and when we go through scripture, don't forget to be able to take a step back from what we're looking at, what we're reading, and apply these truths to what you see in our world on a daily basis, what we see happening in today's society. Look at a few of the, we, had, we barely even got started in this chapter yet, and it's talking about the wicked, the wicked in his pride, persecuting the poor, the wicked boasting of his heart's desire and blessing the covetous. I want you to listen to some statements or one, one particular statement and decide for yourself if this person is a good application of what we've been reading and then what we're going to continue to read about a wicked person. What the Bible says is wicked. Here's the quote. Now I'll tell you I'm good at that. So, you know, I've always taken in money. I like money. I'm very greedy. I'm a greedy person. I shouldn't tell you that. I'm a greedy. I've always been greedy. I love money, right? Now that quote, before I tell you who said, made those statements, doesn't that sound like a proud person? Someone who loves money? Someone who's lifted up in themselves? And there's many, many more statements I didn't have the time to go fill, I didn't, even have, I didn't even care to go back and find all the statements that this person made online. But you can hear them. I've heard plenty of them. And you'll know exactly um, what I'm talking about here in a minute. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, for the love of money. That quote that I just said to you says, I love money. This is what he said, I love money. The Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. That is the source. When a person loves money, that is the source of all evil. So if a person tells you, I love money, how can you possibly say that is not an evil person? They possess the root of all evil. When they love money, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, the love of money is covetousness, whom the Lord abhorreth. Remember that? Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It was interesting seeing how many professing Christians got so fired up to support and not only to support, but to defend Donald Trump when he was running for president. And it's like they close their Bibles. They don't want to look at what the Bible teaches about the characteristics of a wicked person. Because, oh, I've got someone that, that, that says things that aren't politically correct. Oh, well, here's someone. You know, and it's one thing, people who voted for him that just couldn't stand Hillary or whatever. Like, I, I, I get it, but you know what you're doing? You're still voting for an extremely wicked person. And yes, that's who made that statement that I just quoted to you, where he himself openly professed at a rally at people who supported him, many of which are professing Christians, and he's saying, I'm greedy. I love money. And he's playing it off as if that's a good thing. I'm so greedy, I'm going to bring more money into the government. I'm going to make America great again by getting more money in the hands of the government. Yeah, because that's a good plan. He's greedy. He's wicked. He's proud. God hates the proud look. Turn, if you would, to... Uh, Proverbs chapter number 17. Psalm 10 verse 4, I'm going to read this. The Bible says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance. What does his countenance mean? It means his face. 
the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. You have a wicked person, a proud person, someone who loves money, someone who's willing to oppress the poor. And this sermon isn't all about Donald Trump, but you could look up many, many lawsuits and all kinds of things against him for taking advantage of people and oppressing people who didn't have a lot of money like he has, that they wouldn't be able to fight against him in court and just oppressing them and taking their money. You could, you could look that up for yourself. But this is talking about, in general, these wicked people and apply it. There's a lot of people you could apply this to. I mean, just a, virtually every single politician, I'm sure, would fall into this category. And the reason why I'm singling out Donald Trump is because they say, oh, well, he's not a politician. Yes, he is. He doesn't have to be a career politician to be wicked, though. And he is a very wicked man. Don't tell me he's Christian. Don't tell me he's saved. Don't tell me he's a good man. He's not. You know who I'm going to trust? I'm going to trust God. That, that's where my trust is. I'm going to trust what God's word says about a person and the characteristics of a person and how God defines a wicked person over what you think and over your own pride, and over your own love of money, I'm going to trust what the Bible says. Tell me the guy doesn't have a proud look. I mean, every time the guy speaks, he's just talking about how great he is. Oh, I'm so wonderful. Oh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm so great, and these people oh, are terrible, and I'm good, and I'm the Savior, and I'm going to fix everything because I'm good. And just always speaking of himself and how great he is and how much money he's made. Wicked man. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after. He doesn't seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. He doesn't know the Bible. He tries to pretend and he screws that up. Every time he tries to make a, a quote a Bible verse or something, he has no clue what he's talking about. He couldn't even tell you the names of the books of the Bible. Proverbs 17, I told you to turn there, look at verse 15. The Bible says, He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even both, they both are abomination to the Lord. You know what abomination is? It's strong hatred. God hates. God thinks it's an abomination. You know what else God thinks is abomination? Is when a man lies with a man as he lies with a woman. God, the Bible says that's an abomination. So think about how disgusting that is and think about how much God hates that act, O Christian. And then think about this verse in Proverbs 17, 15. It says, he that justifieth the wicked. So those of you that want to justify the wicked, proud, evil president of the United States, you want to justify him. God hates that. It's an abomination. Don't justify the wicked. Oh, but he's giving me more money in my taxes back this year. Don't justify the wicked. Turn back if you go to Proverbs 15. We're going to see a lot of, of references to the wicked because you see that just that term used in, in Psalm 10 multiple times talking about the wicked, the wicked, and it tells us all these different things about the wicked. Proverbs does the same thing. And actually throughout the Bible, you'll see the same thing where it's referring to a wicked person. We're going to see some of the attributes of what the Bible says, the wicked. Because I don't believe this is just your average sinner. As we get into this, we're going to, we're going to see this a little bit more though. Proverbs 15, look at verse number 26, the Bible says, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. But the words of the pure are pleasant words. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house. But he that hateth gifts shall live. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. You want God to bless the United States? And then you're going to promote somebody who's wicked? Well, guess what? The Lord is far from the wicked. It's not going to work that way. If you want God's blessing, then maybe people ought to be looking for someone 
who's a little bit more righteous, at least righteous enough to not be known as wicked in the Bible. Wicked. Let's start with someone that doesn't love money. Because when you love money, that's what your decisions are going to be based off of, how much you love money. Why don't we get someone who's supposed to be a leader or a ruler or someone who's supposed to execute the law? That's someone who is just, someone who cares about right and wrong, not how much stinking money they could make. Turn if you went to Proverbs chapter 6. You're going to see a lot of hatred coming from God against the wicked. It's not a mistake that over and over and over again, we're seeing the same concept driven home all over the Bible in many different references. Proverbs 6, look at verse 16. The Bible says, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. There's that word again, abomination. That is not a light term. Maybe we should be paying attention. Abomination, abomination. The wicked are abomination. The thoughts of the wicked are abomination. The Lord's far from the wicked. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look is number one. Number one in the list, a proud look. God hates the proud look. A lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Keep that term in mind. That's another abomination unto the Lord. The heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies and he that soweth discord among brethren. Flip uh, forward if you would to Proverbs 12. Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs 12 verse number 5. The Bible reads, the thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. They're liars. The wicked are deceitful. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood. But the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. The wicked are overthrown and are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. Jump down to verse number 10. So notice, they're liars, they're deceitful, they're lying in wait for blood. A righteous man, verse number 10, regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. So the wicked person, their mercy. What's mercy? Mercy is when you're letting up, when you're showing compassion, when you're showing empathy on somebody. When you're being merciful, the wicked person, it says their mercy is when they're letting up is cruel. It's cruel. They don't have mercy is what that's saying. At best, they're being cruel. That's the wicked. Verse number 11, He that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. Yeah, the people that follow the vain person, the vain leader, that's all about themselves, that's full of pride, they lack understanding. What does that mean? They're stupid. These people that are supporting the proud man, the wicked man, the greedy man, are stupid. They lack understanding. And I don't care how old they are. They're dumb. That's what the Bible says. That's not even my opinion. I mean, it is my opinion, but that's, I didn't make that up. The Bible says, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. So go ahead, keep following your vain person because you're void of understanding. You don't have understanding. Verse 12, the wicked desireth the net of evil men. But the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit. The wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. Jump down to verse number 26. The Bible says, The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduceth them. So watch out for the way of the wicked because they're going to try to seduce righteous people by their wicked ways, by their, by their wicked greed, by, their, by the, the, the wicked end or the wicked results of their robbing and stealing from the poor. Oh, look how much money I have. And they're seducing people with their money, with their riches that they got through evil means. Going back to Psalm 10, keeping all those attributes in, line, in mind, look, the wicked, 
according to Bible, they lie in wait for blood. They're wicked. They're cruel. They're, you know, they're, they're evil men. They're greedy. Their thoughts are an abomination to the Lord. They're proud. Psalm 10, look at verse number 5, back in Psalm 10. The Bible says his ways are always grievous. His ways are always grievous. So his, in context, is referring to the wicked, the wicked person. His ways are always grievous, but then this, he switches, thy judgments are far above out of his sight. God's judgments on the wicked, they're far above, they're way out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffed them. So now it switches back to his being the, the pronoun used there for the wicked. He puffeth at his enemies. Verse number six, again, the, same, the wicked person, he hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. They're so full of themselves, they think nothing's going to stop me. Nobody could stand up to me. I am like God. This is the heart of the wicked. Verse number seven, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. It matches up with what we already saw in Proverbs. Deceit, liars, fraud, cursing. Under his tongue is, is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. What are they doing? He's hiding. He's lying in wait. He's lurking for people, looking to pounce, looking to set the trap. That's the wicked person. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. <coughs> Murderers. His eyes are privily set against the poor. Notice how often the wicked person is just targeting the poor. Just targeting this, the, the people that are, that, are not, that, are, that are easier targets. This description here, even just in Psalm 10, for, regardless of everything we saw in Proverbs, this is a great description of the psychopath. Now, I just saw the new documentary put out by Verity Baptist Church. It's awesome. Psychopath reprobates. And this is, this is, you know, for people who don't understand the reprobate or the rejected of God doctrine, they really ought to see that documentary because it does an excellent job of showing and proving how it's true. It's just a truth. It's a truth from the Bible, and it's a truth even of this world that the world isn't able to put together that the Bible already said it. But when you look at the wisdom of the world as far as these people who are psychopaths, they exhibit every single characteristic of the reprobate that the Bible already tells us about. You think about all the, the, the serial killers and the psychopaths, their mouth being full of cursing, deceit, Fraud, mischief, getting into trouble, vanity, vain things, lurking places, in secret places, murdering the innocent. That is the wicked. His ways are always grievous. Turn if you go to Romans chapter 1. We're going to see these, these characteristics from Psalm 10 being reiterated again in, in Romans chapter 1. And I'm not going to go through and take the time going through all of it, but Romans 1, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, actually. You just, you've probably heard this many times already before. Verse number 21, the Bible says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. So remember when I told you to remember that, that verse, wicked imaginations, and a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations? That was describing the, um, the wicked person. The Bible says they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They're saying, oh, look how smart I am. Look how great. What is that? Pride. It's pride. They reject God and they're full of themselves. But they're really fools. They're really void of understanding. They don't understand at all. By rejecting God, they became very fools. They think they're real smart. They're full of themselves. 
And they have these various attributes. Back to Psalm 10, when we look at verse number 9, the Bible says, He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. The predators. What was a lion? A lion's a predator. A lion's a king of the jungle, but a lion's a predator. When a lion's looking for food, he's looking for his prey, they sneak up on him privily. They crouch down and they sneak up on him and then they jump and attack and kill and destroy. And that's what the lion does. He says, he lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. So the wicked person is like a lion going after his prey, but they go after the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net, saying traps for the poor. That is a wicked person, my friend. He croucheth and humbleth himself. Now, that word humbleth himself, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have pride. You got to take it in context. What it does, it says he croucheth and humbleth. So if you were to get on your knees before God and to pray before God, you're humbling yourself. So when you get down, this is humility. This is being humble because you're getting down, right? That's what it's referring to, crouching down, getting low. You're lowering yourself. You're humbling yourself, but that's just physically. This isn't talking about their heart. The only reason they're humbling themselves or lowering themselves is to not be seen like a lion to pounce on their prey. So don't be confused by that. In um, verse number 10, he croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. Why? He's still looking to destroy. He's looking to trap them. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. This is an attitude that we see. These people are so full of themselves. They actually think, oh, God already forgot about it. God's moved on. There's so many things happening in this world. I got away with it. It doesn't matter that I'm doing this. And, and they, they get this reinforced. Because they're not children, because the wicked person is not a child of God. So they don't get chastened by God. They don't get disciplined by God. They don't get scourged by God. Because they have another punishment coming to them. But that one's not coming till a little bit later. So they think, oh, I got away with it. Oh, nothing bad is happening. Oh, I'm, I'm persecuting the poor. I'm murdering the innocent. And nobody's caught me. And I'm getting away with it. And my life is still really good. So this feeds in to their own pride. To the point to where they think, God must not care. It, who is, if God was real, he must be doing something about this, but he's not. So this is, this is the mind of the psychopath, of the wicked person. He says he will never see it. So if you went to Psalm 94, we're going to see a very similar um, circumstance here. Similar event in Psalm 94 about someone who's claiming, some wicked person say, oh, God's forgotten, he's hiding his face. And uh, Psalm 94 is very similar to what we're reading here in Psalm 10. Psalm 94, verse number 3, the Bible says, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? Right? It's the same question. It's very similar to how Psalm 10 started off, you know, why, why are you hiding, God? What, what's going on? Why are you standing far off? In Psalm 94, he's saying, well, how long is the wicked going to triumph, Lord? I mean, they seem to be winning. They seem to be prospering. They seem to be doing really well. How long shall they utter and speak hard things and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? God, how long are you going to let this go on? Where are you, God? Again, because we see things in such a short segment of time, we don't see the end Always and, and, and understand the end. Verse number five, they break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They're like, oh, they're doing us harm. They're hurting us. They're afflicting us. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. The poor, the needy, the fatherless, the widows, all of the weak people, all the people that can't defend themselves from the, the, the power of the wicked rich person. He says, they're doing all this wickedness. Verse 7, yet they say, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. They have no regard. They have no respect. They think, oh, God's just going to look it over, no big deal. We're all sinners, and I'm one too, and God's just going to overlook it. No problem. No, he's not. 
But this is their attitude. They get so full of themselves, they think that, huh, who's God? He's not going to do anything. He hasn't done anything to this point. And they just get so full of themselves. It's ridiculous. Uh, verse number nine, he that planted the ear, shall he not hear? Now, this is, this is where some wisdom comes in. God made the ear. Do you think he's not going to hear what's going on? He that formed the eye, shall not he see? He's the one that gave you sight. Do you think he doesn't see what's going on? He that chastiseth the heathen, shall not he correct? Is he not going to make things right? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall not he know? He's the one that gives knowledge. Do you think he doesn't know what's going on? Are you really that foolish? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. God knows your very thoughts. You are a very foolish individual if you think God doesn't see or know everything that happens in this world or that you could get away with anything. God is a God of justice and God is going to right every wrong. And if you are right with God, if you are a righteous person, then you ought to love the judgment of God and can't wait. God, I can't wait till you right every wrong and make everything right again, Lord, and stop the mouth of the wicked. And when these wicked people who are persecuting the poor are cast into hell, praise God. Praise God. Back to Psalm 10. Let's finish out this, this chapter. Verse number 12. The Bible says, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble. Now, when humble is being used here, it's, it's of course, this is referring to the righteous people who are humble in their heart or in their spirit toward God because they need somebody to stand up for them, to protect them. So the psalmist is saying, you know, arise, O Lord. Arise, God, God, help us. Lift up your hand. Your hand is mighty, mightier than all these wicked people, God. You can deal with them. Help us out. Verse 13, wherefore doth the wicked contemn? That word contemn means hate. It's like the word contempt. Wherefore do the, doth the wicked contemn God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest mischief and spite to requite it with thy hand. The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Verse 15, another righteous request of a righteous person. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. God, break their arm. Break their teeth. Knock all their teeth out of their mouth, Lord. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. Uncover everything of the wicked till there's nothing left, no stone left unturned. Verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt Cause thou an ear to hear, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. God is the king and God will one day make everything right again. We need to be crying out to the Lord when we are going through times of tribulation and persecution. We ought to be calling out to God and requesting God to do right. There's nothing wrong with that. There are many people that are ignorantly sinning against God, that have ignorantly been deceived as the Apostle Paul, as the soldiers that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross, where Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Those are people who are ignorantly sinning, ignorantly doing evil things. But the wicked, who the Bible calls the wicked person, the reprobate. Look at, and we didn't go into everything with the last three verses in Romans chapter one. Read all of the attributes. The haters of God, disobedient to parents that are full of maliciousness and covetousness. They're implacable. They're unmerciful. As we saw here, that their mercies are cruel. That's who the wicked is. That's who the wicked is being described as. They're reprobate. Those people, let God burn them. No sympathy. 
the wicked that are lying in wait and shedding innocent blood and oppressing the poor and have lifted themselves up and they love money and they've rejected God. Let God bring the judgment swiftly upon them. Let them go down to hell quickly. But the rest of the sinners, let's go out and get them saved and God help us to have a right heart and to have wisdom and to be able to discern things and not to support the wicked because God hates that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. God, I thank you for teaching us all your great truths. Lord, help us to be able to not just read your words, but to be able to understand them, and not just understand them, but to be able to apply them in our world as we see it today. Dear Lord, help us to make the right choices. Help us to support the right people. Help us to encourage one another to preach your word, to reach the lost with the gospel, dear Lord, and to hate the wicked. Yes, Lord, help us to hate the wicked the wicked that lieth away, the wicked that you've described in Scripture. Break their arm. Knock out their teeth. Lord, hear the cry of your children when we're being persecuted. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to serve you more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.